Hi everybody, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it was quite difficult to find a topic to talk frankly uh, because uh, uh, this is all this FinTech event, four day events, many experts are talking and uh, we're, we're styling around different topics and what to pick. Uh, so from my experiences uh, of fintech, like just to kind of, before starting Multiply Ventures, it's a VC venture capital firm, f investing in fintech, but before that I was part of Paytm Group, as group president there, also worked in China on Alipay, which is another fintech uh, play globally. So from some of my experiences and what I've observed in the market, this is the topic which I've picked up, uh, what's shifting in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, currencies or consumers, uh, and which might be important for all of us to note or maybe look for. And this, you know, it touches upon what's coming in future. And I'm also going to touch upon how it has impacted us in last maybe seven, eight years and how that trend is going to go further. So let me start maybe the first uh, thing with identities. Now what are identities? Many times when we say identities is basically something what you have heard world words called KYC or when you say bank account, passport number, Facebook ID, WhatsApp ID, these are nothing but identities. What has happened with identities and how it has shifted the uh, kind of, I would say, the entire ecosystem is if you look at those pictures, right, we started with maybe paper-based identities. So earlier or even today's banks right now, they'll ask you for a, okay, give me a ration card, give me a PAN card. So they're actually deriving your identity like me being Bhushan is known to be Bhushan because I hold a passport or I hold, a, let's say, one particular government ID, Aadhaar or something and they'll create a derived identity out, out of it and give a maybe account number, which is very cryptic, long, early it was smaller number, now it's very, very long number, right? Eventually what happened is somebody called PayPal came in and then said that, you know what, I'm not going to have this derived identity from outside systems, but I'm going to give customer, I will empower customers and maybe derive identity not from a government or a ID system, but I will create it from a email address itself. Now interestingly what happened with email addresses, email address is not given to me by anybody else, email addresses came to me by, because I have created my email address. What has happened here, this is where the global shift happened. Email address suddenly didn't come from government ecosystem, it came from my own desire of creating my own ID. I can still say cool Bhushan or something like that. So I, I got empowered to create those IDs. Another thing is this suddenly became global. So this is where a suddenly globalization happens. And PayPal as a company could go global very easily because their ID system was based on a global identity, not on a local identity of a PAN card, which is harder for, let's say, a US bank account to open my account with the PAN card in India. Subsequently, what happened, this identity is, it from government IDs came into, let's say, email addresses, eventually called a phone number. So what happened with this is my phone number, which was given by telecom company, not by, let's say, email provider, that became my ID identity to do a banking transaction. So what has happened with this is, one trend which you'll notice, the IDs are coming closer to human being. They were third party IDs, they were my email address, my phone number, eventually you're talking about thumb based or a biometric IDs and eventually if you extrapolate this you might have a DNA based kind of a banking identifications also. So one trend which is happening is they're getting closer to human. Second one obviously the problem with this paper based identities is there is a cost. Somebody has to steal your PAN card, somebody has to verify the PAN card etc. But imagine if you get into a face, face based banking or a biometric things, you don't need a cost of creating ID. You are born with the ID. So nobody has to spend money on creating the, those IDs. That's another important thing. The new identities which the world is adopting are intrinsically available with you. They are implicitly given to you. They are not, you don't have a even pain of creating your email address outside. You don't have even a pain of creating other IDs. Your phone, maybe it's your face or your thumb or whatever DNA eventually or genes possibly can become your biomarkers and ID for fintech ecosystems. So what is happening with this is natural distribution. You don't have to distribute or create these IDs further. Second one is these are uh, cheaper, far cheaper than any anybody printing any even simple paper, right? So now what happens with these IDs is, let's look at maybe technology and before, before that I'll touch upon the last point is going beyond human. So we have seen like banking now is no more related only to let's say people, right? Or let's say mature people, you have banking even for let's say teenagers. 
and I'm sure that come two three years down the line, like we have pet insurances, I'm sure that we'll have pet banking also. Somebody will get a new banking for pets, so at least I can, if not anything, I can track my banking up with respect to my pet because you're spending a lot of money about that pet anyway, right? Hopefully there is no credit about the pet and nobody can take loans on pets, but possibly that's where we are heading. What are the technology things if you're looking for a master class perspective? What are how does the technology changes because of this phenomenon, right? Now imagine the fear which got many banks in US had when PayPal came into picture because their ID which they gave became irrelevant. Many of the people started using email as ID. Now the guy who was in his technology ecosystem said that my bank account is my primary ID. This guy said, you know what, I'm going to change your ID itself. That's like a Tesla kind of a phenomena, right? And, or Apple phenomena, which came in for a, in a banking system that, you know what, you, I will make your system irrelevant because I'm going to create new IDs for people. And what, th 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 there was a huge fear of irrelevancy. And as in this ID shift, there is irrelevancy. Imagine today we are talking about UPI, wallets, uh, and those kind of plays. Imagine if you get into biometric, let's say IDs, let's say my thumb in itself, my thumb uh, impression becomes an identity for banking, maybe the existing system what we see today, again will have to change. So what is important is, uh, and how do you mitigate this irrelevancy which kicks into this ecosystem, is readiness of shifting this identity. So like we have seen in telecom, there is a number portability came in, right? Airtel said that, you know what, I can put your number from any other provider or Jio, etc. Similar thing is required in a banking ecosystem, but it's very hard because many of the banking system work on these IDs as a core system. But if you have a system which says that, you know what, I'm a wallet ecosystem, I'm a UPA ecosystem today, but hey, hey, tomorrow if it shifts to, let's say, uh, biometric, I'm no problem, I can still map it to that. Or multi-identity, so when I travel, I will use my biomarker ID. When I'm in India, I will use my credit card or a banking ID. So there could be portability of these IDs, which is required from a technology perspective. Uh, Inheritance. Now, obviously, we have seen the documentary inheritances. My child gets my money because of inheritance, but maybe with, with some identity shifts, inheritances can also be derived and changed. Um, and obviously, now this also gives ch ch new challenges because a lot of frauds happen because of identities. And if you understand this trend of identity shifts, you will also figure out how my fraud ecosystem or my, how my, let's say, uh, uh, transactional fraud or identity frauds, I need to take care with respect to new identities, right? So there is definite technology requirement or at least people have to understand in the ecosystem that these IDs are going to impact us over a period of time, both in terms of how we set up the technology as well as how we look at the frauds and uh, multiple other things over a period of time. So that's the first shift. Moving to the second shift is currencies. So many times, and I think the simplest shift what we understand today is crypto, right? So many, so f for many years we have been living with like a cash or a kind of a uh, digital cash to some extent, but crypto came into picture. So these, the currency shifts are happening. But if I tell you that this is not new, we, we are always actually shifting currencies. If you look at what happened traditionally, uh, we, there were kings, right? So there, there, are, there is, uh, let's say, Maharashtra kingdom or Maratha kingdom, there is a Delhi kingdom, one of these kingdoms, and they had their own coins, right? So as we shifted, as we went little from those, maybe the kingdoms to a country level, we want, we felt that this gold coins, etc., need to be uh, basically extended at a country level. And now today nothing but we are looking at can we have global currency. So the currency was always shifting its form factor from smallest of the region to the largest of the region. And, and that's, that has been happening uh, uh, all the time. What also happened with this shift is if you look at the currencies when they shifted the forms, there are few in, uh, things this shift wanted. Maybe a king, a rich king can afford gold coins or gold kind of a cash uh, uh, or silver kind of coins, etc. Today we cannot afford. India as a government had to give this steel or whatever those uh, multi-alloy kind of coins. So what is happening? The cost of creating currencies or the actual instrument of value exchange is getting cheaper and cheaper. And with digital obviously make it to some extent cheapest, I would call it as. So the cost of currencies or the cash instrument value exchange, we can call it as in a nutshell, uh, is getting cheaper and cheaper. Another thing that I think is what is happening is the governance, right? The governance of cash was again shifting from kings to national uh, countries and now is global. But when you go global, 
the country governance is still pocketed. So, for example, when we look at India rupee, it's possibly controlled by Indian kind of government, etc. Maybe dollar is controlled by other countries. But when consumer one global currencies, they need to be controlled differently. Now, typically, what the control what we have seen is it is portable, right? So you can put a rupee to let's say pound or a euro through a dollar kind of a thing. So there are certain kind of norms which countries adopted. But what is happening? This governance is also changing its, I would say, hands. So as we see many countries came together, many country governments came together to govern the currencies. We will have more such entities con controlling the uh, currency governance, right? Uh, and if the currency by nature itself is global, then how do we, how do you look at this? Because there is nothing called global government, right? There is, there has to be new models which will come into picture. So this is also interesting thing to look at. Another thing is easy and scalable. So most of the global currencies nowadays, if you look at, they will be far easy to use. And that's why we don't wait, uh, or let's say when crypto phenomena happen or digital currency phenomena happen in, in many other countries, people didn't wait for government to print a currency or give it to banks, etc. It just come bottom up, uh, or option will happen because of the nature itself. I think another thing is multi-formats, right? So for example, look at the denomination of currencies, right? The denomination of currencies in India, for example, we have from let's say one rupee coin to up to 2000 rupee notes many other countries it's just 100 dollars is the maximum kind of a unit that is because the value what you need to buy certain asset in india might need cheaper denominations where in some other country need higher denominations now what happens here is again like maybe the global currency let's say take some abc currency which you are looking globally that has to be denominated differently in different countries you might have a minimum of let's say five dollar equivalent in other countries but maybe you have one dollar equivalent in india where that's a minimum thing required uh, also what is happening in currencies is so what was a currency? If you look at currencies, basically when I exchange some goods, to, there is a, I would say more like a value exchange. If Because I'm doing this transaction and this is value that let's say X, uh, or let's say magnitude, let's say X kg of value, I convert that into rupee and then there is a rupee currency around it, right? But today what happened because of digital transfers, what is also happening is the asset itself can be transferred without actually bringing in currency into picture. And that's what you can maybe NFT world you would have seen, right? NFT just gets transferred. You just exchange the value itself, right? If I'm buying an insurance for you and you want in lieu of that you want to give me the services, it's fine. And today that happens in country to country. Many times, for example, India would do a treaty with certain country of oil exchange, etc. You don't need to go through third party currency like a dollar, etc. to exchange a value. You just settle the net off and do the only that net off transactions. So that more and more of, of that is going to come in with currencies. Now look at from a technology perspective, how does it matter from technology? One is we are moving toward globalized currencies. So any currency, in fact, if you look at trend in India, right, we, 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 are, we have a rupee currency now and we want to glo global with rupee. Right? Dollar was global but now every country which has a significant currency and we want to be a leapfrog in a fintech ecosystem, they would naturally want to bring their, make, this, make their currencies global. Because they're not waiting for identity to global, right? Like yesterday we saw some sessions upstairs that we're talking about uh, these BB, global BBPS where the cross-border transactions can happen in dollar, etc. So it's a natural need as the identity people, as the consumers are going global, if I, my email address is global, my let's say Facebook ID is global, my WhatsApp ID is global, phone number is global, my biometric is global, naturally any currency which I hold, if there will be pressure on currencies to go global. Second is multimodal conversions, like how do I convert? I don't have to convert always, always through a dollar to dollar, but there could be value related exchanges which will happen. Obviously, it has a lot of regulatory challenges, and that is going to be a lot of fun. We'll see, right? There's always a push pull whether currencies manage uh, through governments or currencies are managed through third parties, uh, but or consumers directly managing that currencies. I think so. Some interesting regulatory challenges we'll see, which will come into picture. Uh, also merging BFS and verticals. Now money is available in different formats, right? For example, in a bank I will have money in my saving option, I might have overdraft, I might have credit, different options. If you look at from a regulatory perspective, from a governance perspective, you are siloed, right? So somebody would say, you know what, you, your loan book has to be separate uh, with only lending banks or MBFCs. Your credit books have to be separate with credit cards, approved company, etc. But if you look at from a consumer perspective, the same. It's same consumer looking for my loan, my kind of savings, etc. So what is happening is we will actually see because of this currency conversions, 
you will also see BFS have vertical, sorry, regulators merging together. And today they work in silo, but I think tomorrow they have to work together, figuring out at a consumer level how do I merge together. And we have seen a lot of push pull between, let's say, regulated entities, consumers, and in between fintechs. They have been tried to be, we are trying to get verticalizations from, uh, we are trying to see, we have actually seen witnessing verticalization as a regulatory thing, but maybe eventually it will merge because the consumer level anyways merges. Because two, one lender and one credit card company, at a consumer level I can manage and maybe pay for my loan to other credit card. All this merging happens at a consumer level and possibly will happen across currencies also. Um, obviously, now, if currency is changing, what is happening is money monetization strategy of BFSI is also changing. For example, just to be an example, uh, so far when we will do rupee transactions, there are MDR charges. There are charges which are open in transaction. So when I transact, some money will be taken from my transaction or somebody will pay, let's say merchant will pay or sub, uh, sub, uh, uh, seller will pay based from the transaction amount itself. But uh, what is happening with newer currency, if it's digital, then the transaction charges will go down. So how do BFSI fintechs will make money? Right? The money uh, might also, the monetization strategy might move from transaction to storage. In fact, that is what is happening in crypto right now. Transaction charges are very small, but when you store it in a blockchain, there's a heavy charge. So it's almost like in a current phenomena, in banks might not charge you for any transfer of money, but when you store in a bank wallet or bank vault, those uh, whatever you call it as uh, safe boxes, they are charged. So we might have storage level charges as possibly a fintech uh, requirement or new fintechs might look at monetization from a storage perspective. Moving on, uh, um, and this, I said monetization strategy because of currencies will also change. Last one is consumers. Now obviously we talked about identities are changing or currency are changing, but what is also happening is consumer is also changing. We imagine, let's say, all of us have been given those coins, let's say gold coins, thick looking coin, etc. We might not even be able to carry a lot of that currency with ourselves, right? So current consumers are changing. So what is happening with consumers? One is global mindset. The fact that I can link my bank, uh, my money, money with me, my email address, my phone number, my biometric IDs, you want that money to be global. So this is a global mindset coming into picture and the boundaries are mainly for regulatory and polit pol pol political purposes but generally money for example is or the consumer requirements, many of the uh, students for example during COVID type they started learning courses which are global courses, many of us might have domains which are booked across uh, the country. So this is a global mindset which is coming into picture. So the consumer definitely is born global uh, from a monetization perspective. Second is going macro. What happened before is we have we were happy doing larger transactions, but today we are, we we want to do smaller transactions, smaller ticket transactions. I I want to even off let's say even a five rupee transaction right away. If you look if you go back let's say 10 15 years back right many times if a typical chai wala or any kind of vendor you would have many transactions done in like a khata book khata kind of a thing because you don't have instrument to pay those 5 rupees 10 rupees 20 rupees kind of instrument that's why consumers created their own kind of books today we don't need book because somebody can pay 5 rupees so microfication of transactions is happening and that's very very important and as we go global and the currencies might get divided in different countries for different ways denominations microfication of transactions is bound to happen. So if you are doing any kind of fintech things, it's important to look at how, what is the smallest denomination of a value I can transfer digitally and do I still make money out of it or not. Transaction vibrancy, obviously vibrancy of transaction has grown multifold. You would have paid only to 10 different places in a day, now you are paying 50 to 60 different places. Sometimes the payment is happening implicitly, you might not be doing it also because it's just automatic some mandates etc. So vibrancy of transaction is very very high and it will go further. Mass and multi-party settlements. It's important as the vibrancy is happening. What used to happen, look at 10 years back, I was buying certain thing from a goods vendor, I paid the money to the goods vendor, and it's a two-party transaction most of the times. But today what happens is the transaction itself is going multi-party. What I mean by that is, Today look at if I'm ordering a food from a Swiggy guy or a Zomato, the restaurant needs to get paid, Swiggy needs to get paid, the guy who's going to bring thing needs to get, maybe that migrate application which actually gives me a small thing to allow that guy or not also get paid. So there are multiple vendors who are getting paid. So the suddenly the vibrancy of transaction or a multi-party settlement are going to go higher. And again, if you take the same 100 rupee transaction gets divided into five different vendors or a, uh, I would say service providers, microfication is bound to happen. 
obviously there are challenge, like thing, challenges or opportunities for us to kind of look at from a technology perspective here, taking into account these things. Like one is creating global platforms. So whatever you do, I think come two to three year down line, anything what you are doing today possibly needs a global footprint of some sort. Um, ease versus protection challenges. While we are looking at microfication, mass adoption, vibrancy, uh, while it is easy to build, it actually uh, basically adds a lot of protection challenges. Because it's easy to build a fraud protection system for a high value transaction because somebody is paying you to create those systems. But if I am, a, let's say, fintech company or bank allows, let's say, Estrels or UPI light, uh, maybe with the 200 rupees uh, is a smaller amount to transfer. But what happens at that amount, the magnitude of, uh, you don't have enough money to create fraud prevention plays, etc. So there are protection challenges which come to picture. Um, transaction cost, as I said, in currencies, as you microfy, the money which you make on transaction possibly is almost tending to zero. So you'll have to figure out new forms of making money. And possibly it could again lead to, let's say, storage of money, etc., rather than actually transaction led kind of monies. LTV. So uh, this is another form factor which maybe banks are not looking today. They are looking only from loyalty perspective. But LTV becomes important that if I'm doing only very small transactions, how do I make money as a fintech or a business or a government or whatever? you might be looking at LTV models. So instead of looking on ta putting taxes on each of the transactions, GST or service taxes, you might look at, hey, hey, you know what? If you cost 100 rupees in a day, I'm going to charge you GST. If I cost X uh, month, so it will be batching of taxation, possibly also come into picture uh, from all the regulatory purposes. And obviously, last one is important is global scores. Today, many of the consumers, today have civil scores or any credit scores, they are very confined to what taxes you file in a country and they cannot be ported globally. But consumers do expect you to have global scores. Today, they don't exist. But with this globalization of currencies, identity, etc., I think there's a huge opportunity as well as maybe challenges for us to create global scores or global credit uh, scores where with my Indian credit, I can actually get some uh, leverage, let's say, in other country when I'm traveling abroad, right? Uh, why should I be always carrying the effects uh, in cash format? I should have enough credit there itself. So those are the few trends what we have seen. Um, and I think definitely this uh, would hopefully it opens up a little bit of a mind for you guys that what are the underlying changes which we have seen. Some of these changes actually happening from traditional ecosystems, from, from like very, very family-oriented routines, to what we see today and that will continue to happen and as this happens there are some new challenges and new kind of ecosystems what we are going to see or witness so it will be interesting to look at how those things happen um, so that's from my side happy to take more questions I think in a few minutes yeah, yeah please Yeah, and I think this is an interesting question, and, but, and there's no definite answer, right? Uh, because, and, I'll, and maybe the answer lies in history, if I take the same topic. Countries created their own currencies, but they exp then, then they needed to do cross-border transactions, and that's why they, they had to agree certain kind of norms, like e Euro uh, came in to agree within, uh, as an agreement within Europe, or dollar as a global currency model, now RP is trying to create its kind of format, etc. So what I think is going to happen, I think maybe next 8 to 10 years, I think there will be a lot of fuzziness of how do we exchange value. Like maybe if you look at last 20, 30 years or 50 years, dollar was kind of a standard which people were accepting and then obviously there's backed by asset like gold, etc. Uh, so there was some kind of a logic to it. But I think next 8 to 10 years as this system is evolving and we don't know what is the end point of evolution of currencies and even customers changes, etc. The, there's a lot of fuzziness which is going to happen. That's the, in fact, the reason we are asking this question is because that, that how do I convert my USDT or US dollar in a currency and then they, maybe there are coins and there are NFTs. So that fuzziness will continue. That's why the governments will come into picture. But again, I think my simplest answer will at least, it will continue at least for five, four, four, four to five years minimum until somebody takes a, and typically it might not be government, it will be some private organization 
running some coins or something, we'll say, here is my way of converting. Like USDT today to some extent works within, let's say, a crypto ecosystem, but can it open? Uh, so it will be more like an, I think, five to six years that might happen. But fuzziness, might, maybe the beauty of this whole fintech ecosystem might lie in the fuzziness itself. Like the hedging happens within dollar, etc. Because there's a fuzziness. I don't know what will happen to dollar tomorrow, right? And that's where you make money or lose money. And maybe that fuzziness might go higher to give that, <laughs> to play a little bit more uh, wiggle room to kind of uh, make or lose money. Like in case of dollars, it was tied to gold earlier, right? Now it is no more tied to gold. Yeah. So now it's tied to economy, maybe. Exactly. So there's this lot of lot of uh, uh, changes happening so fast, uh, and and determining the underlying value of an asset is always going to be a challenge. Yeah. And I think that is where I think even look at portfolio. If you are like a HNI and your port you have a portfolio manager, etc., they would also like in a in a rupee world and rural world, they said actually keep it in multiple currencies, park in different assets, and that's what is going to happen. Like maybe, and I've seen like many of the portfolio managers. In fact, we ourselves being venture capital, we actually the way we guide our kind of investors also or our investing companies, it uh, diversify. So you might not always be great in only holding currency in certain uh, money in certain currency or asset in certain currencies. You might diversify in other currencies also or coins or assets which could be derived asset like NFT. NFT, I would still say maybe still we have to figure out what is the NFT play over a period of time, at least from my personal viewpoint. Yeah. So just one last question. Uh, so you spoke about uh, identity uh, uh, like uh, hijacking, not hijacking, but uh, heredity. So if I have my identity as an Aadhaar card, or if I have uh, some bank accounts, uh, and say if I, uh, some, like my kids needs to inherit my property, right? So how would, how do you envision this to be happening? Like can my kids go to just uh, one place and say, this is my father's uh, pen card or Aadhaar card number. Can you transfer all the property to my name? Right? Uh, yeah, so I think what, what's happening again, like, like Today, the inheritance is through documentary thing, right? But if you look at biologically, we are connected, right? By the DNA can be matched, right? And you can prove this guy is whose kid and how 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 much even percentage, right? Is more mothers or more fathers, etc. From a genomic perspective. So I think if you build that actually, and if there is a DNA, and, and there are companies working on that, there's something called genome patri, etc., which comes from identity creation, etc. But used mainly in health right now, and some of this will come definite. Possibly, it will come in format where you are very particular about your inheritance, you, you might say, that I don't want to follow documentary, I want to follow my DNA hierarchies for transfers, right? So I think those options would definitely open. Already, I think some countries, they are looking at that, uh, especially HNIs and larger uh, wealth, wealth uh, houses. How do you inherit, not just from documentary, but also from a, a genomics? All right, so I Thank think you. we are done with the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Mr. Bhushan Patil, for this.